Okay, let's work on your execue speak. I'm worried about blank. Don't you worry about blank. Let me worry about blank. Good. I also would have accepted blank. Blank! You're not looking at the big picture! Hey guys, Rafi here from the Endgame Investor, and I have a very special guest who I'm very excited to meet for the first time, though I've heard of him for a very long time. He's been a, a little hero of mine. I think he ran for the governor uh, for the for the gubernatorial race of New Jersey, correct? That's correct, Rafi. 1997, yeah. 25 years ago. Right. So this is uh, Murray Sabrin. Um, he is in the circles of Tom Woods, if you're familiar with the uh, Mises uh, wing of the libertarian community. Um, he was friends with uh, the great Bob Wenzel of Economic Policy Journal and TargetLiberty.com, the two most influential blogs personally on my life, uh, I think. Um, I, I would there wouldn't be a, when when Bob was blogging, there wouldn't be a day that I wouldn't visit those two sites first to see what was going on. And Bob really influenced me uh, in terms of investment and seeing the economy in, a, in an Austrian lens. And um, I called him the uh, I called him a libertarian street fighter because that's what he was. He wasn't really an academic, though. He that was, you know, he, he, he did know academia, but he was he was really a libertarian street fighter. And he introduced me to Murray Sabrin. Whose, camp, whose political campaigns were an inspiration to me. So welcome, Murray. Happy Hanukkah. And uh, welcome to the Endgame Investor. I'm glad to have you on. Thank you, Rafi. It's a great time to be with you. Uh, there are so many issues to discuss, uh, given uh, how the world is unfolding before our eyes. And sometimes we read about these events in history, but right now we're living through them. Yeah. So on that topic, um, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you, you're, you're much more experienced in life than I am. I'm not even 40 years old. You've been on this planet longer than I have, though. One thing I do say to my kids is we all just got here and we're all about to leave. But uh, <laughs> you've, you've been here longer than I have. And in that perspective, uh, I, I became libertarian around 2012 when I was maybe, uh, well, how, what year, 2022? So 10 years ago. Uh, and I was... Uh, I wasn't even 30 yet. I was in my late 20s. And that's when I that's when I was becoming that way for for maybe 10 years before that. But when I totally broke it off with government and I said, look, we're not in a relationship anymore. I just want you out. That was that was when I found Ron Paul in 2012. And then you came along later. Now, what was going on in my head at that time was um, sort of this sort of line of thinking, like I, I, I really wish people would become more libertarian and go towards our direction of things, because life would be so much better and we'd be, all be making a lot more money. We'd all be a lot wealthier and people would be happier and there'd be less fighting. I wish that's what could happen. And then I tried to fight in that direction. But something changed in 2020, right? I knew intellectually until 2020 that there was going to be some kind of calamity. I, I always knew that in my head because you can't keep going in this direction and things are going in one direction. It's a positive feedback loop and things are going to blow up. But, but in 2020, things changed because I saw... Uh, that it was more than just you. It, it was more than just I wish people would become more libertarian because life would be so much better. It's like if we don't and if we keep going in this direction, things are going to be act absolutely horrible. I mean, I saw what happened in the last two years, especially with the medical tyranny, which really scared me. Which really it, it traumatized me. It's going to shape the rest of my life how people acted and uh, and how my family acted and people around me acted. And things that I would have never thought them capable of, and they did. So I'm trying to figure out in this new world where, where not am, only am I fighting for people to become more libertarian, but I'm seeing a real threat and it's scary of what, how people can behave when they buy into the government narrative uh, and then they try to violate my bodily rights, not even necessarily raising taxes or stealing from me, or, but really trying to get things into my body and threatening me. That, that was a different thing entirely. Um, did, did that change for you um, in, in more of an urgency or did you know, did you see this coming from, you know, a mile away or how did it change your thinking when, when it threatened you physically? Well, what was happening uh, in 2019, I gave my farewell address at the college at Ramapo College in New Jersey because I was uh, planning to retire in July of 2020. This is right before COVID. And uh, the, the title of my talk was America, the next 70 years. And given what was unfolding in America, I said, we're probably going to have more online education. We're probably going to have more um, work at home. And this is before blank. 
pounds. And so the, the trend that was occurring in America was going toward that direction, especially at the higher education level. A lot of uh, faculty members were teaching online already and uh, blank just uh, accelerated that process. But I never thought it was going to happen at the um, K through 12 education because I don't think that's appropriate to teach online to, to youngsters. I think kids need socialization. They need to have that um, relationship with their teachers uh, in, in, in person. And so uh, that was that's what threw me for a loop uh, because there was no reason to have these blank for uh, K through 12 education. Having said that, when blank hit, uh, I was on the board of directors of the co-op uh, in the uh, in Fort Lee, New Jersey, where we were living, and uh, the the board decided to make some draconian restrictions regarding uh, the occupants, the residents of the of the shareholders of the of the co-op. You had to wear masks. Uh, there was no mandate. For blank. However, the staff had to get blank, and so we moved uh, to F Florida in uh, June of uh, 2021, and so uh, at that time there was still very strict restrictions in place. And uh, in New Jersey, Blank. then uh, the closing of schools, the closing of businesses, uh, just made it very difficult to have normal civilization. Of course, the big box stores were open, Main Street stores were closed, uh, restaurants were basically only takeout. And of course, what came along Blank. at the end of 2020, and I said, um, you don't develop Blank. in a year. It's just, it just doesn't happen. Um, I grew up in the age of uh, polio, the polio, Blank. It was introduced in the 1950s. We got the polio blank because of uh, all the uh, adverse consequences of uh, polio uh, prior to that. And so I was comfortable taking blank that had been developed, that had been proven itself uh, through testing and trials. And so when this blank came along and I started reading up about it and having the discussions with uh, physicians who I known and uh, other folks, reading online uh, the critiques of, of the so-called blank, which is not blank. It's really gene therapy. And that's the thing that the American people don't understand. Once you have blank, you should be one and done with uh, for most of your life. Or in the case of the blank, you get a blank somewhere down the road, 10, 15 years later. So everything was indicating to me that this was not good medical practices. And uh, what was happening, Rafi, which is really disturbing to me, who's been around a long time, is I grew up in an age where the doctor-patient relationship was the foundation of good medical practice, not some pronouncement from the blank or some state health department. And so uh, we've lived through flu uh, epidemics in the United States before. We had the late 50s, uh, early 60s. We had the uh, late 60s, the Hong Kong flu. We got through it without any blank, without masking, which is another issue that doesn't make any sense. In fact, Fauci initially said, you don't have to wear a mask. It doesn't make any sense to wear a mask. Then he said, wear a mask, wear a double mask. And you still have people wearing masks and they've proven to be ineffective for uh, whatever transmission is occurring. And from everything I've learned about blank, it really affects the elderly who have underlying conditions. It doesn't generally affect healthy people in your age group or in my age group, which is uh, a lot older than your age group. And so if you're generally healthy, our immune systems protect us from any pathogens that come our way, viruses, what have you. And you also take uh, measures to improve your immune system. So in uh, April of 2020, my last semester at the college, I hosted a webinar of medical folks, members of the state legislature in New Jersey, financial people. In fact, the late Bob Wenzel was, on, was part of that webinar. And we talked about all the ramifications. Blank. And one of the uh, uh, presenters was a naturopath, a longtime friend of mine, who listed all the supplements you should be taking to improve your uh, respiratory tract. Where Blank! It hits. And so my wife and I have been taking these supplements since then for more than two and a half years. And as they say, knock on wood, we haven't had any problem. We've been in public. Uh, uh, There's some places you had to wear a mask, even though uh, I really didn't want to just for a few minutes and I, I try to pull it down as much as possible. But being in Florida for the last year and a half, um, the only place you needed to wear a mask was the doctor's office. And a few months ago, they eliminated the masks in the doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. So it's been a pleasure being here. Not only is the weather great compared to the Northeast, the Midwest, we're having this incredible frigid weather, but uh, it's more free, more open. And one of the things that uh, you, you mentioned is bodily autonomy. Where is the, where does the government have the right to tell you to take a medication that uh, you don't want to have. And uh, 
uh, my doctor up north recommended taking the uh, blank. I said, I'm not taking it because I don't believe I need it. Uh, from everything I've learned, this is a very bad flu. And if you're in a nursing home, not getting enough hydration, not getting enough supplements, not getting vitamin D3, uh, your immune system is really compromised. And if you've got diabetes, arthritis, heart problems, uh, cancer, whatever chronic illness you may have, you are really susceptible. So that's the target population that should have been isolated, not young people, not healthy people who should have gone out uh, on our business and um, and not have these draconian blank, not have the mandated blank. I spoke to someone from New Jersey the other day who works in a hospital and she had to get blank, but she didn't get blank. And um, they called her in and said, you're not blank. And we don't know what to do with you. So I don't think she's going to get blank because uh, she finally saw the light that you don't need a blank, let alone blank to stay healthy. And so we have a real problem, not only in America, but around the world where governments are dictating medical practice. I never hired the government to be my physician. Mm-hmm. I go to physicians for different ailments. I listen to what they have to say. They, t- uh, they pro- uh, provide me with uh, treatments for any ailment that I may have. I either accept accept it or not accept it. And uh, that's the way it should be. As the individual, you should be the final uh, decision maker regarding any medical treatment that you want. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we're seeing today is what you pointed out very clearly is medical authoritarianism. And this is very dangerous because what could happen down the road if God forbid there's another blank that the government may force you to take the man, uh, the blank. And if you don't, they may put you in isolation like they did in China. And yeah. uh, China is not a very good model for me- good medical practice. And so uh, I'm really concerned that we've taken a giant leap forward from 2019 before Blank! to where we are today, where privacy is uh, uh, basically gone in America, both financial privacy and medical privacy, where the government has, is, has rule over businesses, what they can do and cannot do. And... Um, and we have these terrible sanctions against Russia, who is not a threat to the United States. So we have this all-encompassing big government in Washington, D.C., that libertarians have been warning about for decades, actually for more than 100 years, going back to the 19th century. They've been warning about the, intru- the encroachment of government. And as uh, the great Bob Higgs wrote in his book, uh, Crisis in Leviathan, every time there's a crisis, government ratchets up its um, its ruling o- over the people and we're seeing this right now this is a perfect example case study of uh robert higgs's thesis in his book crisis and leviathan that the crisis is always used as a pretext for government to expand its power and the government never recedes after the crisis is over with uh, and so uh the, the government has in their back pocket probably scenarios where they will take over literally the economy if we have another blank and uh, this is the concern I have for this decade because we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, we have this incredible bubble that is bursting before our eyes, and mm-hmm. we're probably going to have a fairly steep recession in 2023, something I, I, I forecast a year ago in Fortune magazine because the Fed just threw caution to the wind and inflated the dollar, creating trillions of dollars literally overnight. Yeah. And that money is spreading through the economy, which is the theme of my uh, 1981 doctoral dissertation, Mm -hmm. and raising prices. It's not about greed of business people uh, that the inflation rate hit the highest level in 40 years in 2022. There are people who claim that businesses are greedy. That's why we have inflation. Well, they weren't greedy three years ago because when we had 1% inflation. So what changed? What changed is the Federal Reserve creating trillions and trillions of dollars, giving us a a huge stock market bubble, which has been deflated for the past year, a huge bond market bubble, a huge real estate bubble, and housing prices, as you know, have gone through the roof in certain uh, locations around the country. Here in Southwest Florida, there there are reports, prices in some uh, uh, developments are up 100% in the last three years. As people have fled the Northeast, the upper Midwest, and the demand for housing has gone through the roof. And uh, I, I hear stories of prices literally uh, going up 10, 20% overnight. Mm-hmm. That's, not, that's not an indication of a sound market or a sound economy because uh, interest rates were kept so low. 
mortgage rates were three percent on the 30-year uh, mortgage and people were buying hand over fist because uh, at three percent with inflation right now at seven percent you have a negative uh, interest rate when you have a negative interest rate it pays to borrow because you're paying back in cheaper dollars so we have a perfect storm that has occurred in the united states and around the world uh, yeah. medical authoritarianism endless printing of money huge budget deficits more regulation um, economic sanctions and so when you mix, put that in the mix together uh, the amazing thing rafi and this is something that really i think libertarians uh should be uh, more cognizant of Despite all the things that government throws at the economy, men and women entrepreneurs in Israel, in the United States, all over the world, still are inventing, still are innovating, still are creating. And that's why uh, the supply of goods and services are, pr uh, are pretty, ro the, is ro robust. You go into uh, the big box stores, everything is available. You go into the supermarket, virtually everything is available. Despite the supply chain disruptions that we've had, and um, the distortions caused by government policy. So I'm just, uh, I wouldn't say amazed, I, I, I've realized this for a long time, that the free market, the free enterprise system, as, uh, despite being distorted and interfered, for, interfered with by the government, still provides an abundance of goods and services. Now, energy, as you know, is a big problem in Western Europe because of the sanctions against Russia. So we'll see how this plays out this winter, but, um, Anytime the government gets involved in the economy, we know there will be either shortages or higher prices than, the, yeah. than, than what happen in the free market. Because the free market does one beautiful thing. It balances supply and demand. So there can never be shortages. There can never be uh, uh, disruptions in the free market unless there's some natural catastrophe like a, like a hurricane like we had in Southwest Florida recently. I was listening to Tom Woods uh, on that day. I had a long drive and I, I listened to your interview with Tom Woods also and I listened to other ones. And he was arguing with somebody about, about Ron DeSantis. And the, he, and the, the argument was, um, it was a libertarian. I forgot who it was. He was saying, I'm not going to vote for Ron DeSantis. Libertarians should not vote for Ron DeSantis because he's very bad on foreign policy. He's going to agitate Russia and this and that and, and you know, build up NATO or whatever, even though he's really good on blank. So I thought about that and I was like, okay, fine. That's a legitimate point. I see the danger there. And I, I understand that Ron DeSantis is really bad on foreign policy. Okay. But I think that 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 the need to fight back from what has happened to America and the world in each domestic country on a domestic level is more important than even foreign policy. And I would never put anything in front of foreign policy until 2020. And the 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 prospect of really putting these people on trial and getting the truth out there as to what actually happened, we have a much better chance of that happening if Ron DeSantis is president than we do. If uh, if Donald Trump is president and Biden is president and they, you know, they desecrate the office of the presidency, which is also important, but it's more important, I think, to to really fight back at these blank tyranny people as hard as we can. And that's why I think that uh, it, it's important for libertarians to vote for Ron DeSantis. You make a great point, Rafi, because, as you know, some libertarians put foreign policy at the forefront because war drives a lot of domestic policy as well. The printing of money the uh, obscene expenditures of the Pentagon, and in order to offset that, um, uh, the Washington Party, which I call the Democrats and Republicans, except for except uh, for a few uh, Republicans who are pretty good on, on, on the war issue, um, they're very comfortable just expanding the size and scope of government. But uh, war is something that is uh, terrible from a moral perspective because innocent people are dying. Innocent people are being hurt by these sanctions. And uh, one thing that libertarians should not uh, condone is uh, the, uh, the government harming innocent people. And that's, uh, I think, a, a benchmark that we should be uh, talking about and uh, debating with, uh, within ourselves and with the, uh, and with the general public uh, regarding what is a good foreign policy. So having said that, uh, libertarians will either uh, not vote in the 2024 election or vote for the Libertarian Party candidate, whoever that may be. Uh, but uh, the, we know the Libertarian Party uh, candidate for uh, president is not going to win. So the question is, um, what do Libertarians do in 2024? Does it really matter if they vote for DeSantis or Biden or whoever is the Democratic nominee, if DeSantis is the GOP nominee? And um, since I'm in the, uh, Florida and um, I, I can uh, have access to the local paper with letters to the editor or possibly op-eds, I could make the point that if um, Ron DeSantis is consistent in his blank policies, uh, with other policies, she should have 
a, a non interfere a non uh, non interventionist foreign policy, which is the same thing as having a non interventionist blank policy where the, we don't dictate to the people what their medical protocol should be. That should be decided between the doctor and the patient. And so we've got to get away from this um, this interventionist uh, paradigm that we've been in since the end of World War II. So that's going to be interesting how that plays out. Uh, but um, if DeSantis takes a very hard line against um, uh, Russia uh, with more support for Ukraine, which is, I think, just uh, morally untenable and uh, politically disastrous, uh, but the average person doesn't care, it seems, because it doesn't affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. And so since that is so far away from them, uh, American troops are not there, but if the Patriot defense missiles are go into the Ukraine, um, Putin says this is a provocation and he may retaliate because those P Patriot defense missiles may be manned by U.S. soldiers. Then what, then what do you have? You basically have a direct confrontation between the United States and Russia, which would be a disaster because Russia has nukes and we have nukes. Are we going to have a budding of the heads of two nuclear powers, which we almost had 60 years ago? I remember vividly the Cuban Missile Crisis when we were talking about possible mushroom clouds over New York City. So Biden is treading on a very dangerous uh, situation here by increasing the support for Ukraine with $45 billion in this omnibus. Or whoever it is that's in charge. I don't think it's Biden, but whoever it no, is. No, of course he's not in charge. I mean, he barely knows where he is. I yeah. mean, uh, he calls Zelensky Belinsky the other day uh, mm -hmm. in, in Washington, D.C. So, um, so Biden uh, is, is just basically the mouthpiece for whoever is uh, running his uh, administration behind the scenes. And we have a pretty good idea who that is. So it seems that the neoconservatives have taken over the American foreign policy establishment. They are determined what our foreign policy will be. And it's based upon the 1997 manifesto of Project for a New American Century which talks about taking out Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, um, taking out um, uh, in Syria, uh, the leader of Syria. And so this is, this is their blueprint. And they think this is a great thing for, quote, world democracy. But what it's done is called death and destruction around the world. And now, of course, uh, they're saber rattling against China as well. So our policy of, of belligerence, and that's the only way to describe it, has to be changed. And if we don't change it, we're going to have World War III. And the Ukraine could be the flashpoint for World War III. So uh, DeSantis, uh, hopefully, if he becomes a candidate, he will uh, sign on with Colonel McGregor, who has been on Fox News criticizing our foreign policy. Tucker Carlson has been criticizing our foreign policy and other influential opinion leaders in the, in, in the United States. And uh, hopefully a lot of libertarians, Ron Paul and others will uh, do the same thing. And DeSantis will realize that, uh, why is he signing on to a neoconservative foreign policy, which has been a disaster in Iraq. It's been yeah. a disaster with Iran. So we need to get to a world of peace and no entangling alliances, which George Washington uh, told us about in his farewell address uh, well over 200 years ago. So uh, we have a lot of work to do as libertarians here in the States to, uh, to make sure that uh, we follow a policy of peace and diplomacy and not of belligerence and, uh, and uh, military intervention. I was here, I was listening to your interview with Tom Woods and you were talking about um, all the languages that your family spoke, right? It was uh, Yiddish, Russian. I think your father spoke French or spoke four or five <laughs> different languages. Well, you, do you, you know Yiddish, you said, and um, your father knew Hebrew. What other language, what languages do you speak? Well, I grew up speaking Yiddish because that was the language at home. My parents spoke Yiddish uh, at home uh, because that they were Jewish. Uh, mm -hmm. They spoke Polish because that was the uh, they were living in Poland, so they spoke the native language. My father then learned Hebrew, Russian, and German. So he spoke five languages before he came to the States. My mother uh, spoke Yiddish and Polish. Um, she knew a little Russian. I should know any uh, Hebrew or German, I don't think she spoke German. She may have picked up some German when we were living in Germany for three years from 1946 to 1949. Mm -hmm. But my father was incredible with languages. He would have friends come from Israel to the States uh, in the 1950s and 60s. And he spoke Hebrew uh, like he was a native uh, Israeli without having spoken 
Hebrew to anyone in this in the states. I mean, he was just amazing. He didn't pass that gene along to me, which I'm very disappointed because uh, it would be nice to speak several languages in today's world. I did uh, study Spanish in junior high school, high school, and college. I never became fluent in it, but um, I told my students when I was uh, teaching at Ramapo College that if they really want to uh, have a great business career, and I told this to them since I started teaching in 1985, learn Spanish because the Hispanic population is growing and it's a big market. I don't know how many of them took my advice. And I said, if you're really industrious, you'd learn Chinese. And so uh, could you imagine speaking Spanish, Chinese, Russian today, and obviously yeah. English to have those four languages? You could write your own ticket in the business world with those four languages. Um, yeah. You really would have the ability to work in international business um, seamlessly. And um, when we were in China many years ago, we were at lunch and uh, there was a gentleman at the next table and he, and he came over to us. He said, I heard you uh, talking about uh, uh, your tour and he and he's, uh, was representing a major U.S. company, privately held company, and he's fluent in Chinese and he was uh, going over a 200-page contract in Chinese with the uh, Chinese uh, partners or whoever they were dealing with. Nice. So it's amazing that you meet people who have this incredible skill. I mean, Chinese is probably one of the most difficult languages in the world to master. And he was there going over a 200 page contract in Chinese, which is really uh, remarkable. And so uh, this is the thing that you want to instill in students is that don't be so um, ethnocentric and learn about the world you live in. And that's what made me curious when You'll love this story, Rafi. Mm -hmm. One of my bar mitzvah gifts, I think I mentioned that on Tom Wood Show, was an atlas. And I read that constantly to see what the world is all about. And I became a history major and a geography minor. And I mm -hmm. got my PhD in economic geography. So I studied every region of the world. At one time, I could tell you everything that was going on economically around the world, uh, not only the economy, but also the topography, the, the geology, and all that good stuff. And uh, it's just a good way of becoming, uh, for lack of a better term, a global citizen where you have an, a basic appreciation of other peoples and cultures. And we've done extensive traveling around the world. We wanted to make it to Israel. We haven't gotten there yet. And um, you know, blank put a real damper on our travel plans because you had to be blank uh, to go on some of these tours. And so uh, since uh, we're not blank, we, uh, we can't go on these tours which require blank well if you're gonna so, if, you, if you make it to israel definitely give me a call you recently wrote a, a new book that's premiering on amazon or or um uh, an ebook form you can i think there are certain days you can get it free or did that already pass um that's already what's, said, what's the book that's up and and what what are your next projects and what, what are you up to these days well i wrote this autobiography to explain to uh, especially young people my journey from uh, being a liberal in the 60s to being a libertarian uh, beginning in the 1970s so it's called from um, immigrant to public intellectual uh, an american story and the publisher uh, just loves the book he thinks it should be read by as many americans and of course people in other parts of the world because it's a story of coming to america with virtually nothing and uh, building a life here without any public assistance just my father worked hard in a pencil factory in a sheet metal factory and then as a new york city uh, cab driver and he provided for his family and didn't feel sorry for himself that he lost all his family members uh, during the Holocaust. I, they, I never heard him um, angry about uh, Germany. In fact, when we, uh, I told him we were going to Germany in 1992 on a summer vacation, he was thrilled. He said, you got to go visit this town that you were born in outside of Munich. So we got to Munich on this tour, but we didn't make it to the town that I was born in. So. Uh, but he never expressed any any hatred for the German people at all, which I was really amazed. And when, and when I asked him stories uh, uh, about World War II, there was never any bitterness in his um, in his voice. Same thing with my mother. And I was really amazed at that because you would think that uh, in, being in a war where all your members are targeted because they were Jewish, um, just I found astonishing that uh, he didn't have anything negative to say about um, what happened, except that, of course, there was a horrible event in his life and, and his family's life. But um, I, I was just really so shocked that uh, he didn't go off on a rant about Germany. In fact, he had, he had a lot of respect for the German culture and, uh, and, and people. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what his thinking was about why he was so 
for lack of a better term, sedate about recalling his events in uh, World War II. By the way, he wrote in a memoir in Yiddish, which my older brother had translated, it's called Why We Dare to Live, and that's available on Amazon. My older brother uh, took that project on, under his wing, and it's just a great uh, story of his uh, experiences during World War II. And at the end, there's a story there at the end uh, of his experiences uh, at the end of the war, which he never told me. And when I read this uh, for the first time many years ago, uh, it sent chill up my spine. So Rafi, if you get a chance to read the book, either in Kindle or paperback, you'll understand why um, uh, he said no, and that uh, uh, made it possible for him to survive the war. So what are the names of the books again? Uh, from Immigrant to Public Intellectual, an American Story, available on Kindle and paperback on Amazon at a really incredibly low price of $3.99 and $6.99. Uh, the publisher wanted to keep the book at a low price so everyone can have access to it. And We Dare to Live is uh, my father's uh, memoirs of World War II. Okay. I like to read that because personally, um, I did not live through the Holocaust. I'm not claiming that I ever did, but um, I did live through blank. And that was traumatizing for me um, in terms of just seeing how people can totally change how they how they interact with you or don't interact with you and all of a sudden they just turn against you and they were friends the day before and now you're not blank and so now you're a disease carrier and you have to be fired from your job it's like like what what just happened it's, it's, it's amazing and and it's hard it's hard for me to come to terms with that and go back to normal which i haven't i haven't gotten back to that yet and um i eventually i, I mean i would like to <laughs> understand how your father was able to let go of his experience to a point where he what he didn't hold a grudge and he wasn't hateful and he was able to continue with life but it seems that that kind of strength is what allowed him to raise a family like a normal human being after being traumatized in such a way otherwise he wouldn't be able to do it it was amazing i mean uh, i was just really just so surprised that uh he recounted it like he was a reporter of World War II, as opposed to participant of World War II. that uh, didn't have any effect on on his uh on his uh, psyche, but maybe it did. Maybe there were demons while he was sleeping. I don't know, uh, but we know a lot of Holocaust survivors um, have trauma after, after the war, or they have a form of PTSD. And it, how did it affect his personality? I don't know because I didn't know him before I was born and I didn't know what he was like before, uh, before the war. And so uh, all these events have tra tra uh, traumatizing effects on people. The Vietnam War on, on my generation, the baby boomers who went to war, a, a huge impact. One of my um, neighborhood friends was in Vietnam and he refuses to talk about his experience in Vietnam. So God knows what he saw in Vietnam as a soldier yeah. uh, for a year. So uh, people deal with circumstances in different ways, Rafi, as we know. And one of the themes of my book, uh, when people read it, the challenges that I had as a youngster and as an adult, it's about perseverance, it's about resilience, yeah. a positive mental attitude, and uh, a lot of luck. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, if it's a show, you call a show. Uh, I really appreciate it. We're going to put all the links to your books down in the description below. And please uh, click on them, support Murray's work. And I hope to speak to you again soon. If you're in Israel, just please let me know and uh, we'll meet up. Thank you, Rafi. It's a great being with you. All right. Happy Sonica. Fry, we're worried about Planet Express. Don't you worry about Planet Express. Let me worry about blank.